All right, hello, and welcome back to our uh, to our study of experiencing God. Now, it's been a little bit since we did part one, since we did the introduction, um, and, and basically, kind of what what we want to pick up there in the introduction is that um, the the key the key thing that Jesus says he's he's uh, he's speaking in John chapter seventeen, and he says, "Now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, the Father." And Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. This is eternal life. They may know you. Knowing God. That's what we're talking about whenever we're talking about experiencing God. We come to know God as we experience Him. And we come to experience Him more and more as we get to know Him more. Now that word knowing isn't just kind of knowing some figures. And, and maybe reading a theology book or two. Or a commentary. Or, or even reading through the entire Bible. It's not knowing facts about God. It's not knowing different names of God or, or things like that. Although those are all important. This word know is the same word that, that Mary uses. Whenever they, the angel appears to her and says, Hey Mary, you're going to have a child and he's going to be named Jesus. And she says, how could this possibly be? Since I don't know a man. It's an intimate knowledge. And that's what eternal life is. Eternal life is having this intimate, this intimate knowledge of, of God. An intimate knowledge of Him. And so, we talked a little bit last time about how we get to know God and, and how whenever we are saying the names of God, we're calling upon His presence. We're, we're calling His presence in. And we're saying, we want to be near you, God. We want you near us. We want to know you. So as we continue on, there's three similarities in the people that God involved in his work. So God, uh, when we study the way that God involved the men and women of the Bible in his work, there's three similarities, okay, um, that these men and these women shared. One, when God spoke, they knew that it was God. They didn't have any question as to could this be God? Is this someone else? They knew it was God. So when God spoke, they knew that it was Him, that it was God. The second one, they knew what God was saying. And the third one, they knew what they were supposed to do in response to what God said. They knew it was God. They knew what God was saying. And they knew what they were supposed to do in response. So whenever we talk about experiencing God, we're going to be talking about um, seven realities that are a part of experiencing God. We want to get involved in the experience of God. And so there's seven realities. I'm just going to, I'm going to list them and then we'll, we'll start to talk about them a little more um, in detail as we go along. Seven realities. One, God is always at work around you. Second one is that God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that's real and personal. Number three, God invites you to become involved with Him in His work. The fourth one is that God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstance, and through the church in order to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. The fifth one, God's invitation for you to work with Him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. Number six, you must make major adjustments in your life in order to join God in what He's doing. And the seventh one, you come to know God by experience as you obey Him and he accomplishes his work through you. So those are the seven realities, and we're going to talk a little bit more about each of these. Let's start with the first one. Let's talk. Let's start with God is always at work around you. And I want you to think about the story of Moses. Now, now Moses. One thing that I that I hope you get from this is that Moses isn't waiting around for a burning bush. I, I hear. I often hear people say, "Man, I'm just waiting for my burning bush experience." I'm just waiting for God to blare it out like he did to Moses. 
The thing is that Moses had never experienced a burning bush, and so he's not going around waiting for it or anything like that. So, so let's start there. Let's, let's have that in your mind because we're going to come back to it, okay? So God is always at work around you. Now think about the story of Moses, okay? In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25, I'm going to read something here that involves all the details of Moses' life. Moses isn't even mentioned in these verses. Here we go. Exodus 2, 23 through 25. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. So God heard their groaning. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked at the Israelites and was concerned about them. Notice here he doesn't say anything about Moses. But God was already at work all around Moses. Whenever he came to Moses in that burning bush. You see, God had a purpose that he was working out in Moses' world. And even though Moses is in exile, even though he's in the desert, he was right on God's schedule, right in the fullness of God's timing, right in the middle of God's will. Moses didn't have to think of some ministry assignment. God was already at work, and he invited Moses to join him in what he was already doing. God was already at work. And I don't know what your world is looking like, but here's one thing I can promise you. God is at work around you and around me and around us. God's at work in our world right now. Right now, just as he was in Moses' world. He was, he was at work, and his will was going to be accomplished whether Moses was a part of it or not. His will was going to be done because it was a covenant that he made with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And he remembers that covenant. And the people are crying out. Their, re their cry reaches God's ears. God's already at work in the world all around Moses before he ever even appears to Moses in that burning bush. Reality number two says, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that's real and personal. God created humanity for a love relationship with Him. More than anything else, God wants us to love Him with our whole being. And He's the one that initiates the relationship. The next chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 say, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Now, Moses would have never gone into the mountain to meet with God if God didn't initiate the encounter. By giving him a personal invitation. Moses' plans, whenever he took matters into his own hands, led him to be out tending the flocks, the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro. Not to be confused with Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies, okay? Um, who like to eat the vittles, alright? This is uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. That's, that's a cool name, by the way, Jethro. Um... And that's when God, or the angel of the Lord, appears through the burning bush. If God didn't initiate the encounter with a personal invitation, Moses wouldn't have gone to look at this bush. But God does the same thing with you and me. Every day that, that you're alive, God continues to pursue a relationship, a continuing, ongoing love relationship with you that's real and it's personal. And this love relationship with God is so real and so personal. It's an intimate love relationship. 
is probably the most important aspect of knowing and doing the will of God. Because if our relationship with God isn't right, then nothing is right. And so this is what he says in, in chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. Now you're going to get a lot of, a, often a lot of scripture during this study. I, I hope we pay attention to it, because that's far more important than anything I could ever say. This is the word of God. Exodus chapter 24, 12 through, uh, 12 through 18. So it says, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay, and I will give you the tablets of stone. With the law and commands, I have written for their instruction. And then Moses set out with Joshua, his aide, and went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us. We will come back with to you. Aaron and her are here with you. Anyone involved in the dispute can go to them. When Moses went up to the mountain, the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. And for six days the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. And then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain. And he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. You see, time and time again, Moses is invited by God to talk with him, to be with him. God initiated and maintained this continuing relationship with Moses. Their relationship was based on love, and in daily, God fulfilled his purposes through his friend Moses. Their relationship with God was very practical because God guided and provided for his people under Moses' leadership. He guided and provided for the people under Moses' leadership. Now, number three, reality number three. Now, we're, we're not going to get through all of these, all seven of these in this, because I want to try to keep these um, not super long. Uh, but, I, but I want there to be some substance to it. But reality number three says that God invites you to become involved with him in his work. I want to read something to you from, uh, from the book, from, from the book Experiencing God. It says that time and time again, God invited Moses to talk with him and to be with him. God initiated and maintained that continuing love relationship. Here's one, here's one I wanted to read here. Let me skip down. It says, um, this is again under reality number three, that God invites you to become involved with him in his work. God, God is a sovereign ruler of the universe. Sovereign. He is the one who is at work. And he alone has the right to take the initiative and to begin a work. He does not ask us to dream our dreams for him and then, Ask him to bless our plans. He's already at work when he comes to us. His desire is to get us from where we are to where he is already working. When God reveals to you where he is working, that becomes his invitation for us to join him. When God reveals his work to you, that's his timing for you to begin to respond to him. God invited Moses to become involved with him in his work. He said, I have come down to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land. So come, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people out of Egypt. Did you catch that? He doesn't ask us to dream our dreams and ask God to bless our dreams. He doesn't, he doesn't wait for us to say, hey, here's what I'm going to do for you, God. Now bless it. And that's, tip, that's typically our thinking. We, we have kind of this, 
self-centered type of thinking whenever it comes to God. We, we want to do what we want to do, and then we say, God, now please bless this. I'm going to start this ministry, now bless it. I'm going to start this church, please bless it. God invites us. We don't get to say, hey God, this is what I'm going to do, now you please bless this. The important thing isn't, what is God's will for my life, but what's God's will? That's really the question. So many times we as Christians, we feel this urge to do some valuable ministry. We, we, think, we think the burden of thinking up what to do is on us. But we can't do ministry unless God is already doing it. In other words, unless the Spirit of God is at work, no amount of speaking on our part is going to ever convey His heavenly truth. And so for this reason, we don't need to think up a ministry and then ask God to get on board and bless it. It's backwards. We ask God what He's doing, and then we join in. That last verse that I read, that was from uh, Exodus 3, 8 through 10, where it says, God invited Moses. He, he says, I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I'm sending you, Moses, to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. God invites Moses to join in on his work, on his plan. The fourth reality is that God speaks by the Holy Spirit, through the Bible, through prayer, through circumstances, and through the church to reveal Himself, His purpose, and His ways. Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 8 say this. 3, 2 through 8. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look upon God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them. Rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good, spacious land, flowing with milk and honey. It's that same verse again. A land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, so now go. I'm sending you. God came and talked with Moses about his will. God wanted Moses to go to Egypt so that he could deliver the Israelites through him. It's beautiful, isn't it? God revealed to Moses his holiness, his mercy, his power, his name, his purpose to keep his promise to Abraham and give Israel the promised land. Now when God spoke through this burning bush, Moses knew it was God. He knew what God said, and he knew what he was supposed to do in response. And so our Father talks to us, the Heavenly Father talks to us by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, through, through circumstances, through listening in prayer and through praying, and, and through his people 
to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. And this revelation of himself was an invitation for Moses to join God in what he was about to do. And it's the same thing for us today. So we've gone through four of the seven realities. And, and one of the, we're going to get deeper into these each time. So next time we're going to pick up at number five. And we'll recap the first four just very briefly and get into number five. But we're going to dive deeper into these as we go along. So we're not just going to go one through seven real fast. We'll, we'll dive into them a little more. But this, uh, this book, Experiencing God, um, it makes a lot of sense. It, it's, a, it's a study that I feel is very important for, for everyone to do. And, and it's all about God. That's really what it's about. It's not a formula. It's not a, it's not a book to give you a formula like step one, step two, step three. That's not what it is. And that's not what this study is going to be. I'm not going to give you some magic formula to know and experience God. But we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to love Him and experience Him and know Him. So one of the first things is that we realize that He's just, just that He's at work all around us. That God is at work all around us. What if we could realize that? That God is at work around us. Accomplishing his will. That he wants us to be involved. That he has a love relationship. That he's pursuing us with this love relationship. Too many times I'm too busy running to let God love on me. What if I stopped and I slowed down? And let him catch me. So that I can experience that love relationship. That he invites me to become involved with him and what he's already doing. He's not waiting for me to come up with some crazy idea for him. He's going to tell me what he's doing and then he's going to invite me to be involved in his crazy exciting work. And God speaks. Even today. He speaks not just through the Bible, but through our prayer and our circumstances, through the church. God is always speaking to us, inviting us, saying, come be a part of this. And so I hope along the way here in this study that you and I both come to know and experience our beautiful God. And all his splendor and all his holiness. And that we realize that he's at work and that he's inviting us to join him in his work. All right, so until next time, God bless. Love you guys. And uh, tune in next time, okay? And let's see what God has in store for us. Bye.